Okay, good enough. Okay, so <laughs> here we go. Dear Go Nansen McCloskey, you are a professor of economics at University of Illinois. You have written 25 books. You have written over 400 academic articles in many fields, economic, history, politics, and all of this. And we are talking today about your latest book, Leave Me Alone and I Will Make You Rich, How the Bourgeois Deal Enrichment the World. Dear to go, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So I, I, I've been reading this book and I'm just so surprised by the amount of knowledge in so many different disciplines. Uh, of course, uh, starting from history and of course you have written many more books in, in history. You wrote a trilogy, uh, the Bourgeois trilogy. And I guess here you're putting everything together in a more concise form. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just so I wish I had now time to go back and read all the other books in your theology. Well, thank you very much. The the this book is meant to be a more popular summary of the trilogy. Right. I mean, look here. I can show you. Here's. <laughs> Here's one of the books wow. How many in the trilogy. Pages that? You know, this is 500 pages. Then there's another 500 pages one. And then there's one that's 700 pages. So, so you... it's 1,700 pages. See? So, and it's, a, it's meant to be a scholarly book. It's meant to be a serious scientific um, contribution. And so Art Carden and I, my, 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 my co-author decided to write um, a popular book that would be more fun to read and would be shorter. It's only, I don't know, 100, 190 pages right. as against 1,700. And okay. you know, the, the, the range of things that I, I learned, it's partly because I'm old. You know, if you're old and you keep at it, <laughs> You keep reading books and keep thinking, now let's see, if I got it right. You learn a lot of stuff. Okay, so I just have to make a clarification. You you call yourself old, but in thought, you are bringing forward uh, a ideology that is very new. I mean, the yep. way that you think, you are a forward thinker. So, uh, so. Yeah. Hope so. so <laughs> Yes, you have accumulated many years, but you are looking to the future. You're not looking into the past so much. So uh, for that, uh, Deirdre, I wonder if you could give us some background information about yourself. I I, I try to read your uh, curriculum vitae, but it's like almost as long as your books. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if you could just give us a, a summary oh. of how do you get involved into all these academic subjects and, and yes, uh, for example, when you were in high school, what were, what were your goals, ambitions, and well, what when, is it that you wanted to do with your life? When I was in high school, I was a socialist. Okay. I was not a very scholarly socialist, but I thought of myself as a socialist. And this was way back. This was in the 19, late 1950s. So think back then. And it was the era, beginning of the era of folk singing, you know, do, 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 play the guitar. And so I, I, I sang the, the socialist songs because the socialists have the best songs. There's no, there's no doubt about that. So I knew all the labor songs and so on. Then I, so I, I wanted to help the, help the working class to raise them up. So I went to university at Harvard and, uh, and I majored in economics because that seemed a good way to pursue this, to make more of this uh, idea. And so I became a Keynesian because in the early 60s at Harvard College, that's what was on offer. And then gradually, when I went to graduate school there, you, you could call me a, a uh, an economic engineer, still someone on the left. I was against the war in Vietnam and so forth. And then gradually, 
it, it's not that I became right wing. I haven't ever been a conservative. I've never voted for a, a Republican in my life. The last Democrat I voted for, except for Joe Biden, whom I voted for a couple, uh, about a week ago, yay! <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have to move to Canada, which would be very nice, I'm sure. But but um, the last Democrat I voted to, for, for was George McGovern, 1972, against the war in Vietnam. But as I learned economics, I, you see, I was an economist, I gradually started to see that the socialist ideas were not a good way to help the poor. Mm. A much better way to help the poor is to make the economy rich. Right. And so I gradually got more and more clear on that. Although, you know, I have to say that it took a long time. I think I would call myself now an Austrian economist, like Hayek and that right. gang. But, but I don't say that everything I learned before was wrong. It's just that I've gotten now, now by now, terrible. yeah, by, but, but by now, my claim is that for an economics that makes sense, it has to be what's called, what I and a few others call humanomics, right. humanomics, right. economics with the humans left in. Right. And in fact, I'm all, I was actually, I haven't taught since 2015. I'm in the blessed state of retirement. I retired in order to work more <laughs> on my books. And uh, I, I, I was also a professor of English, English, English literature, an adjunct in philosophy and classics. And then I was also in the history department. So I was <laughs> all over the place. But that was a conscious decision that I made in the 19, especially around 1980, to learn the humanities, to learn philosophy in a serious way and, uh, and, and literature and history, criticism. So I've, I've become a kind of a, um, well, <laughs> you might say I've gone completely crazy. I still, I, I, I still believe in economics. I still think that goods are scarce and supply and demand is very nice and so on and so forth. And, I, and I'm still basically an engineer in that I'm very interested in how big things are, wow. quantitative thinking. But okay. I think you have to do both. So how about the thinking that uh, it's almost the Nordic country uh, in Europe are doing what some people call aspirational economics. I mean, they have some socialist uh, main uh, way of making work their country. And this is what many people in the States aspire to. They say yeah. it could be more like Sweden, Iceland. Uh, I was, uh, I mean, it, as it happened just this morning, I, I was writing an article for a, a Swedish uh, uh, newspaper uh, on this very subject. So as we always say, I'm glad you asked that question because, um, well, for one thing, I think people don't understand Sweden very well. I've, I've taught there. I, I do not speak uh, um, Swedish. I'm very bad at languages, unlike you. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I, uh, I'm an idiot about, about languages, but still I have taught there. And I know, and I and I taught in Holland for three years, so I know that social democracy quite well. And the first conclusion is that Sweden is capitalist. It's not really socially. When Saab Motor Company went bank bankrupt and made automobiles. It came to the government of Sweden and said, please, please help us out. They said, go away, Vavia, go away. We don't want to hear about you. When a few years ago, Volvo was bought by the Chinese, the Chinese, Volvo is now a Chinese company. Wow. The Swedish government said, I don't care. So in fact, the, in some ways, the Swedish 
politics, especially in the last 20 years or so, is more capitalist than, than the United States. Because imagine if General Motors was to be purchased by the Chinese, what Congress would do? <laughs> yeah. Rush forward with, no, no, you can't do it, we'll make a law. And, and, and talking about General Motors, General Motors was bailed out uh, in 2008 by, by the government. And mm -hmm. that is, I mean, we talk uh, right. about, against socialism and, and, and right. so, profit corporations, but here so is an example. So it's easy to exaggerate, the, here's what I'm saying. It's easy to exaggerate the difference in this, um, in the actual running of the economy in Sweden or Iceland or Finland or Norway um, and the United States. For example, I, I speak of myself as being a Christian liberal. I am a Christian, I'm an Anglican, um, mainstream Protestant, you know. Um, and so I, I, I do believe that we have an obligation to the poor and the handicapped, and then there needs to be a, a, a safety net. I agree with that. Yet I'm in the, in, in the European sense, I'm a liberal, in that the way I want to do it is through markets. You know, if you want to help the poor with housing, don't make public housing owned by the government. Make the housing regulations such that the private market wants to build houses. And right. for example, there's a tremendous housing shortage in Britain right now. And it's a, it's, it's a big issue. It's been going on for years. And yet, <laughs> one of the reasons there's a big housing shortage is that to, to get the permission to build a house in Britain, I mean, you have to go through hell. Right. <laughs> it's right. very hard. Too much regulation. Much too much re regulation of housing. And, and therefore, they have a housing shortage. Well, you know, if you, if, if you regulate, I don't know, candy bars, <laughs> there'll be a shortage of candy bars. Right. Okay, and how about the idea that uh, millennials, uh, in particular, are idealizing the idea of socialism? They think yeah, the way forward is socialism. Is it that they don't know? Uh, they only see the rosy unicorn rainbow uh, power of socialism, and they don't yes. know the uh, the drawback to socialism. Yes. yes, and I understand that and even sympathize with it because, as I told you, I once had the same opinion. You know, <laughs> I'm fond of making the joke that Jeremy Corbyn, the former head of the Labour Party in Britain, and Bernie Sanders, the left wing, actually he calls himself a socialist, the, the, the senator from Vermont, and I, all three of us were born 42, so old we are. And in 1950, say 58, or 59, all three of us, I'm sure, had exactly the same opinion about capitalism, overthrow it, right? right? And since then, I've learned a thing or two. The two of them, they have the same opinion they had in 1958. They've not learned anything since then. And is there in history any successful attempt to socialism? Is there a country that you could say, that's the country, if I was a socialist, I would like to be like that country. Well, I think your point a few minutes ago about social democracy in Northern Europe, that's the one I would answer because I've lived there and it works pretty well. I mean, I'm not the kind of liberal who says, you know, it's impossible for the government to do anything right. If you have got a homogenous country like Sweden, although they they admit a lot of uh, a, 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 they admit a, a lot of immigrants actually, but anyway, you have a homogenous country like Denmark or Sweden, and they they do kind of social democratic things. It 
it doesn't work so badly. But the problem is that we're not talking about countries like that when we talk about the United States. Right. Or take a worse case, Italy or Mexico. You know, take any of those three countries and social democracy isn't gonna work out very well. It's gonna be corrupted. It's gonna be foolish. It's not gonna, you know, to take a look at the contrast between actually how Sweden has handled the COVID plague and the United States. Now Sweden, as you know, has this unusual policy of not locking down. Right. But <laughs> the Swedes are good to each other and they all wear masks voluntarily. Whereas you, you, you have to only look at a Donald Trump rally. Yeah. To know. So, so, so that's one of the problems. And no fact, a mask has become a political statement. I know. And it's, it's, it, this whole thing, this, this, it's, look, it's very understandable why young people, as you say, view socialism as a kind of, kind of a wonderful unicorn or a rainbow because they grow up in families. We all grow up in families and families are socialist enterprises. So one way of answering your question, has there, is there ever human organizations that are socialists that work well? I say, yep, a family that works well. Now, not all families do, but most of them do. Right. Um, and it's from each according to her ability to each according to his need. And that's the trouble. So we, we, we always grow up as in families. And so when we come to kind of realize that there are poor people in the world, our impulse is to say, well, let's make a, a family of <laughs> what? 330 million people. Mm. And there's the problem. Right. Look, and monasteries, groups of friends. Suppose I, 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 I bring a, a large pizza to the party of my friends. And I say to them in a kind of stupid capitalist way, well, this is what Donald Trump would say. Well, I bought the pizza, I'm gonna eat it all. Well, you wouldn't have very many friends. Right. But for small groups, it, it works. But for large groups, it fails. You know, the big failures are things like Venezuela and uh, Eastern Europe and Maoist China and so forth. Wow. Do you consider, you just mentioned China, you consider China a failure? China? Yes. Well, no, it's not a failure, but it's not a socialist country. It's not, that's correct. At least in the economy, and that's the key. Right. When it was Maoist before 1978, it was really a big economic failure and a failure in every way you could name. You know, the, the um, uh, destroying history and so on and so forth. But then after 78, the leaders, the Chinese Communist leaders said, whoops, we can do better than this. They started to introduce um, free ownership right. and markets. Um, and, and most particularly, the, the counties, the so-called so Xi'an, in China started to compete with each other to get companies to move into their county. Wow. I have a friend, uh, his English name is Steve, Steve Chung, who's a famous, um, uh, famous economist in China. And he persuaded these rulers of the Communist Party to go this way. And it's been fantastically successful. Now, Interestingly, India started doing the same thing after 1991. India was attempting after independence to go in the socialist way, five-year plans and regulation of everything you can name. And then they, par partly I think because China was starting to be successful, they realized we'd better let people start a business where they want go into the occupations they want, 
and India has been growing. Now it's growing faster than China. Wow, that's amazing. That's a, yeah. Okay, I have so many questions. Uh, and uh, uh, um, forgive me about this, but uh, this is a personal question. I saw in your bio that you used to be a man. So before we get to to, uh, to ask you about the book, uh, I I wonder if you could give us some. Well, I, 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 in my account, in my account of my intellectual career, I forgot to mention that in the middle of it, I changed gender. As my mom says, she's very old and very wise. She says, "Don't do anything more interesting." than changing your gender. <laughs> Don't so, decide to, to become a horse or something. So when did so that in happen? And 1990, in, in 1995. Oh. Now, I, I, had been, I had been married for 30 years and had two almost grown um, children at that point. And I had been a faithful husband and father and so on and so forth. And, and uh, you know, the actual truth of the matter is that people change. Okay. They do. There, uh, I had, from age 11 on, or actually when I was age 11 or so, I would go to sleep praying that the next morning I would not stutter. When I was a child, I, I stuttered rather badly, and I still do a little bit. I'm like Joe Biden that way. And that I would be a girl. And I'm fond of joking that eventually, when I became an Episcopalian, an Anglican, I got half of my prayer. You know, I, I still stutter a little bit, but I got to be a girl. <laughs> and so, so it took a long time, but I, I was, a, I was in, in lots of ways a very normal guy. I was, um, and I lo love my wife. She's still the love of my life, although I don't think she loves me anymore, but I was her boyfriend and husband for a third of a century, and, and there wasn't anything false about it. I, I loved her. But um, in 1995, I realized that I could change. I wasn't the earliest, obviously, person to do this kind of thing, but it was rather early. Now it's become so common that you know, when I, when I t would tell my students, I was then teaching at the University of Iowa. When I came back um, to teach more at the University of Iowa, I, I made sure to tell them at the beginning of the class, right? Because I didn't want them going around saying, hey, you know, Professor McCluskey was once a man. And they, they were very uninterested in it. <laughs> this was in the late 90s in, in Iowa. They didn't care. And now, you know, it's on uh, this, what's her name? Um, the, the, the woman who was once an Olympic athlete, uh, can't remember her name. But, I don't remember either, but I know. But, but they're, they're, it's just, it's become boring. <laughs> right, right. Tell me something interesting. So well, and uh, that's okay with me. That's how I want it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, that is, Believe it or not, it may be boring to you, but still, I feel like there is a, a aura of intrigue, and at least on my part, like, wow, how did this happen? I wonder all these psychological well, adjustments and, well, and, I and have society a, I, acceptance. I have a book on it. Okay. It's called Crossing, because I have a book on everything. <laughs> when I, whenever I have a thought, I do a book. So I, I have a book which is an account of the three years of my of uh, of my transition but i i don't what i'm trying to do <laughs> is to drive down the gender change to to say the third sentence of my obituary what i want them to say in the first sentence is deirdre mccluskey was a very interesting economist and historian and she was very nice and so on and so forth. And then by the third sentence, and by the way, she once was a man. <coughs> I don't want to be a professional gender crosser. I want to be a professional scholar. Right. Uh, one more question in regards to that. Now you being a man and a woman, is there um, 
it is said that men have more self-confidence when presenting themselves in this and that. Uh, how you encounter some pushback or some lack of credibility? Well, I mean, you got all these titles after your name, so maybe you don't experience that. But but there's there's a real thing that women lack more self-confidence, and, and I wonder what you. I know point it's of true. I just did a, had a nice um, exchange with Martha Ma, 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 Martha Nussbaum, who is a famous. Um, well, she's a philosopher and she's a scholar of Greek and uh, she, she's a professor of law at the University of Chicago and Martha is a, a friendly acquaintance of mine. And we had, a, we had a nice discussion of this very question. And Martha pointed out that her father, was, who was a lawyer in Philadelphia, was very encouraging to her and didn't ever allow her to to lack confidence. And she went to two schools. She went to a high school, a girl's high school, and then she went to Wellesley College, neither of which allowed her to feel inferior or to have to pretend that she was stupid when the boys, to attract the boys, that kind of thing. And, uh, you, but, but you're absolutely right. There, uh, um, uh, this, self-esteem problem I didn't ever have because I was a boy and a man and I was encouraged you know to be tough and assertive and so on and so forth. Of course the first time <laughs> I was in Holland for a year during my transition and I was standing as Deirdre in a group of, of Dutch economists, all men, and they all knew about me. This was no secret. And we were talking about economics, as economists unfortunately tend to do. And, <laughs> and I made a point, and the men ignored it. Now, they, they didn't know that they had done it, but they did. They just didn't hear it. A few minutes later, George made the identical point. And what do you know? They all said, oh, George, that's a great point. You should have published it in the American Economic Review. And for the first, and I must say the last time, I said to myself, yes, they're treating me like a woman. <laughs> I believe me, it's happened to me many times as it's happened to every woman on the planet. And uh, uh, much, you know, I, I, I can't have had the personal history of a girl and a, and a and a young woman. I transitioned when I was 53 years old. But um, I've had this experience. Okay, so in a situation like that, what is a woman supposed to do? Like Nothing. No, no. You can't do a thing. Because if you complain about it, then they bring out the B word. Yeah. You know I what see. the B word is. Right. I'm not going to say it, but they will. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess a, 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 a way patiently onto society continues evolving and then the voice of a woman will have as much weight as the Maybe. voice of a man. Maybe, although, although uh, Ma, Ma, Martha says, Martha Nussbaum said to me that she'd always wanted to be a, a man. But what she meant is not that she wanted to change gender. Martha is perfectly normal in every way you can name on that front. But what she meant, what she, and she said this, what she, wa she wants to have the intellectual weight that a male scholar of her accomplishments, which are amazing, has. And yet there tends to be even, you know, the, look, sort of look around at the great female scholars or artists and you, you see that they're, they're well, <laughs> a great Canadian, f f great Canadian f feminist said a long time ago, a century ago, in order to get half the credit, a woman has to do right. twice as much as a man. And she said, fortunately, this is not difficult. 
<laughs> okay. Okay, so we let that rest. Okay, now uh, I'd like to go to your book, Leave Me Alone and I Will Make You Rich. Uh, I, in, in Practically in the first chapter, you say that the poorest have been the biggest beneficiary of, uh, of the transformation that has been happening and, and it, inequality has been dramatically being reduced and yep. if you open i don't know a tv or open a newspaper or whatever all we hear is about the 100 and billion dollars of jeff bezos and Warren yeah, Buffett yeah. and elon musk and bill gates and how inequality is destroying our society so yeah. definitely your message in your book is inverse to the message that i'm here in the press so can you yep. uh, dance between those two subjects well, it, 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 yeah, it is tearing our society apart, but it's the news about it, or the, not news isn't quite the word, the statements about it are the things that are tearing our society apart, not the reality. And here's the basic point. This, this is, I think, terribly important. Okay, Jeff Bezos can buy 100 mansions and 50 hundred foot yachts and if he wants to and endow this, this and spend his money on this and eat caviar every, every for, for, eat caviar for, for breakfast. But <laughs> that doesn't make him vastly better off. Saddam Hussein in Iraq had seven palaces. Well, what do you do with seven palaces? <laughs> what do you do? You go from palace to palace. I mean, what's the point? Whereas, what, whereas the, the result of growth since 1800 has been that very poor people, like your ancestors and mine, and the ancestors of all of us, went from having not enough to eat, not having an adequate house, not having central heating, not having any education, to having those things. Now that doesn't mean there aren't any poor people in the world still, but the percentage of very poor people in the world is falling like a stone. Partly because these two countries, China and India, which are four out of every 10 human beings, have been growing very fast for lots of years for in case of china since 1978 and so if you do the distribution of income person by person in the world which seems to me from the ethical point of view to be what you should do inequality is in fact falling and not just a little bit but a lot so, so the, the um, how can I say this, the real comfort or, or of humans has flattened out very, very considerably. In 1800, there were a few kings and priests and so on who had, I don't know, orange trees in their greenhouse. And the rest of us had a diet inadequate in vitamin C but now we all get the vitamin C in the orange, the orange drink. And so that, that's the first point, kind of factual. But then there's a second point, which is harder to, hard, it, it takes longer to argue, so I won't. But it is that inequality is inevitable. You're undoubtedly smarter than me, you. You speak English, but you also speak other languages. I don't. So here it is, dear to the stupid. How do we solve that? What? Do we pound nails into your head until you're as stupid as I am? No. Uh, there are, are, are women who are more beautiful than I am. Now, I admit not too many, but, <laughs> but <laughs> a, a fair number. 
What do we do? How do we equalize that? There are people who are taller than others, shorter, more graceful, you know, and equalizing money income as if that was a desirable thing to do, and it's not. What would you think, think that soccer players and rock musicians should be paid the same as people who don't have those gifts? It's not a sensible thing. Whereas increasing the level of income so that every American and Canadian, Mexican and, and Chinese and Indian is made better off not every, is, is a noble and sensible thing to do. Right, okay, so considering that millions of people are getting out of poverty every day, they are. China and, 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 and India and all these other countries, yeah. how come uh, this is not a story that we hear every day. How come we are so focused on what uh, Bill Gates is doing as opposed to, you know, uh, today uh, 50,000 Chinese came out of poverty for the first time. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, 2,000 Indians were able to open a bank account. How come this is yeah. not the news that we hear? Yeah, that's a very wise way of expressing it. And I frankly, I don't know. One, <clears throat> explanation though I, I can offer, which is that people like to hear bad news. After all, that's the basis of journalism. And it's not evil. I mean, I'm not saying there's, it's fake news or something silly like that. I, I like journalism and do it myself to some degree. And, and I'm all in favor of a free press. But what people want to hear is bad news. And uh, uh, I, I, for example, I think this very book that we're talking about um, is a very nice book. I think it's people should read this book. But it's not going to become a New York Times bestseller. I can guarantee it. <laughs> and the reason is that at, whereas I've had friends and enemies indeed <laughs> who write pessimistic books, and people love to buy those. Right. And, uh, you know, I wish they didn't, but that's just how people are. I can't help it. So it's, uh, you're absolutely right. There's an extremely good book, <coughs> Comparable Bars. In fact, we use a lot of his findings by the late Hans Rosling, R O S L I N G, who is a professor of public health in Sweden. And he's got a book uh, called, uh, I think it's, what's it called? Factfulness or? I fact heard about it, yes. I and it, it's, it. it's very good. It's, it's, he, yes, he's a, he was a wonderful spirit and he's very uh, positive and uh, obviously a very nice fellow. And he makes the case, look, he see, here's how he expresses it in summary form. It's not the 1960s anymore. And this image that I, grew up with when I was a student, that India and China, for example, are hopeless, and that massive numbers of people in the United States go to bed hungry, and there are poor people in France and everywhere else. That is not true anymore. We haven't arrived at nirvana, but it's not true. There, there's, um, there, there's a book by an Oxford e economist forgetting his name, but it's called The Bottom, the bottom Billion. And, but he says, look, in, in, in the 1960s, four out of five people on the planet were desperately poor. Now there are still desperately poor people on the planet, but it's only one billion, it's actually absolute terms, it's fallen, one billion out of out of seven billion. So that's the change. Wow. Okay. Um, so we all have heard stories at one time or another that in order for you to reach uh, happiness economically, you need to be earning about $75,000. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, why a person who has reached this level and 
apparently they have the house, the car, and the education, and all this. Why is it so? Uh, uh, why it makes them so angry that Jeff Bezos have X amount of billion? Well, you and I should go and ask these other people <laughs> that question. We should ask them, what is your complaint exactly? <laughs> Got a nice house in the suburb and a couple of automobiles and your kids go to college. What, what exactly is your complaint? And that's why it's so important that books like this and uh, podcasts like this get out, that people start to think, now, wait a second. Am I being dignified in complaining about Jeff Bezos? You know, that Jeff Bezos did well is because he reinvented the mail order idea. A hundred years ago, Sears Roebuck, uh, um, Montgomery Ward, Spiegel's, and so forth, invented the idea of getting stuff through the mail. And Jeff Bezos had the very smart idea, well, no, wait a second, we can do this with uh, b barcodes and computers and, and, and the internet. And now everyone's doing it. And eventually that model, like the old model of the um, ma mail order, will be competed away. The profits of that will be competed away because other people will come in. That's exactly what happened. It's happened every time. The department store was a great 19th century invention. And then there were department, for, small fortunes all over uh, the United States and France and, the United States and, and Britain and so forth were made by opening a department store in a, in a small town or a small um, city. And then that model gradually was became so common that it wasn't making these what economists call super normal profits. So I, I that's the point. We 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 have to change the ideology. I, I'm not sure we can, but we should try to get people not to be passive. Black lives do matter. And, you know, there are still things that need to be done and changed to make people's lives better off. But envy, as I was saying before, envy is hopeless. I can envy people for all kinds of things. There's a, there's a sonnet of Shakespeare in most, organ, most um, lists of the sonnets. It's number 39, I believe, where Shakespeare bemoans his fate. He says, oh, I don't have this man's wealth or this man's beauty. And then in the end, you know, he always has kind of a punchline. But then I think on the person he loves and I feel that I'm as rich as can be. Well, we ought to have more of that attitude than this envious, you, you can't cure envy but you can cure a lack of scope. And it's not so much about happiness. There's a lot of nonsense talked about goal of the economy. Uh, it's not, you know, happiness. How do you feel on a scale of one to three today? Yeah, it's not a very sensible measure, but it's clear that if your income is $75,000 a year, as against $10,000 a year, you have more human scope and be, can, you don't have to be, you could spend all your time eating Fritos and watching reality TV, but you have the chance at least of a more full human life, of writing poetry like my, my mother does. How about the idea of just taxing the rich to death? Well, that's, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly interested in, in the welfare of the rich. If it worked, I'd be in favor of it. But it doesn't work. It, um, quantitatively, it doesn't work. 
there's not enough money in Jeff Bezos's bank account to much affect the rest of the world, the poor of the world. And there is a deep ethical question why you would confine it to the United States, this redistribution, or to Illinois, or to Chicago. I mean, if, if you're going to be concerned about poor people, you should be concerned, as I'm sure you and I are, with the poor of the world. Right, right. Uh, there's a... We yeah. are the 1% anyway. That's right, exactly. And, and if you, if you there, there's a story about Andrew Carnegie, the great uh, Scottish-American entrepreneur in steel, and in the late 19th century is challenged by, by a socialist to redistribute his wealth. At the time, he was the Jeff Bezos of the world. Right. He, was the, he was the richest man in the world. Um, <laughs> and he had his, he, he had an assistant go back and calculate. And then he came out and, and, and C Carnegie said to the socialist, all right, I'm going to give you 16 cents. <laughs> That's your share of the wealth. See what I mean? So, so from a kind of, even a crude practical point of view, redistribution isn't what does it. It's very important that people understand how big modern economic growth is. The most you could do with redistribution is to, I don't know, increase the income of the poor by 100% or 200%. Modern economic growth has increased the income of the poor. I hear this, 3,000%. It isn't a doubling or a tripling. It's a factor of 30. <laughs> now, which do you want? Do you yeah. want a functioning free economy in which, you know, in fact, I, I hate the word capitalism. It's a stupid word. We should call it innovism. Innovism. Because that, that's what it actually is about. And this, the innovation, like right behind me, see this, this reinforced concrete? That was invented by a French, um, a gardener, but actually he owned the garden, so he was rich um, in the 18, 1850s. Inexpensive steel had just been invented. And so he thought he wanted to make big flower pots, not flower pots, pots in which you could put trees, small trees. And he, he, and he reasoned that if you put steel mesh, in that case, inside the, uh, the cement, which was a Roman or, or uh, Chinese technology, it would be strong, and it was. Now my apartment building is built with reinforced concrete. That's the kind of innovation that right. we got. Right. Okay. Uh, how about um, tell us some other ways in which uh, the current economic uh, model is making us rich? What do you mean? Other ways, I don't the know. You... Innovism. So we have yeah. improved uh, 3,000 3, percent. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned, as an example, the concrete wall behind you. Oh, and yeah. and uh, so, uh, in other words, uh, I'm just I'm just thinking for some more bullet points from your book. Oh, oh, there are a ton of them. I mean, <laughs> bullet points. My mind is full of uh, my, my mind is full of bullets, but but. <laughs> The, um, if you just list the innovations, and they're not all mechanical, and by main, and especially not all of them are about science. Some are, but like the technology we're now enjoying right at this very moment, you couldn't do this without high electronic science. But reinforced concrete is not about high science. And among my favorite examples was invented in 1956 by Malcolm McLean in North Carolina. He was a poor boy. He hadn't been to university, but he owned a trucking firm carrying tobacco. And he thought, suppose we have containers and fill up the container and send it to China, and then they can fill it up. And of course, this 
idea of containers revolutionized transportation. But, and, and that did, had nothing to do with science. It was organizational. The modern university, which so much of us have been the beneficiaries of, and I, it's my industry, it's where I worked, was invented in 1810 in the, at the University of Berlin, which was founded then. And it, it, for the first time, it combined teaching and research. And that's the idea of the modern university. There had been new universities before. It was actually an Indian invention, which was then co copied by the, uh, by the Arabs, and then finally copied by the, uh, by the Europeans, who then thought that they had invented it. This is very common. <laughs> Everyone thought for a long time that the blast furnace making iron was a Swedish invention. Uh -uh. It was Chinese, the way yeah, well, most. And, and uh, the airplane who was invented by bicycle mechanic. Yes, well, but that, it's that kind of cross fertilization that's so characteristic of the modern world. My friend Matt, Matt, Matt Ridley talks about ideas having sex. <laughs> yes, yes. So you have an idea because you, you have a coal mine of bringing the coal out of the mine on tracks and little cars. And then you also have an idea of a high pressure steam engine. It couldn't be low pressure, which was the standard kind of steam engine in the 18th century because it would be too big. And then you combine, <laughs> you put those together and you have the railway. Wow. Yeah. You've invented the railway. And this happens over and over. And it's true of science and scholarship too. I mean, my, my, my life has been, uh, as we say in economics, arbitraging ideas from one part of the intellectual world to the other. So in other words, if you leave the economy function by itself, it's just going to make us rich all. Yes. And yes. it's going to reduce inequality. Yes. Uh, and we yes. just shouldn't interfere so much with it. Yes. And, and let, let me give a concrete example. Occupational licensure. In 1950, in the United States, 5% of jobs required a license from the state. Now, 30% of the jobs require a license from the state. This is crazy. Loco, pazzo, nuts. And it's moving in the wrong direction. Um, in the state of Florida, to practice as an interior decorator, you need to go to school for two years and then you're apprenticed for three and blah, 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 and then you get a license. And the danger here, of course, is that you might paint the wall the wrong color. That's the terrible human catastrophe. So uh, what about negative externalities? Like, I don't know, the example that is bring up more often is the petroleum companies uh, dumping yeah. chemicals in the oceans or something. Well, like that, there, there, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a terrible thing. And there are, there are externalities. But there are ways of handling them <clears throat> that don't involve um, uh, making innovation impossible. Um, if, if someone does that, a, a particularly horrible example of it is um, ashes from power plants, ash, coal ash. You burn coal to make electricity, but there's ash that's the final result of the unburned um, uh, parts of the coal. And what they do is they just pile it up somewhere. And it's filled with heavy metals and it's extremely poisonous, arsenic and all kinds of awful stuff. And, and then a dam breaks somewhere and all this stuff is washed 
into the water supply? Well, the solution to that is tort law. Mm. You, you sue them. <laughs> and, and they soon learn that if they do that kind of stuff, they're going to get sued. Yeah. And they won't do it. Now you can say, well, that's after the event. But, but the problem is that, that most government regulation, some is necessary, but most of it is ineffective. Classic example is housing inspection. In my, in my, my city of Chicago, until rather recently, the, the building inspector, the guy who came around on your construction job and checked out whether you had followed the, the house building code, was corrupt. So he would get $20 on this job, $20 on that job, $20 on that. He'd go around, do 10 jobs, and make $200 a day. And nothing would get inspected, really inspected. So that, you know, you, as James, James Madison, one of the architects of the American Constitution said, if men were angels, government would be unnecessary. But of course, as he also said, when you're constructing a government, you better realize that people are not angels. And that if you make it profitable for building inspectors to cheat and, to, and for coal, uh, uh, power companies to dump their stuff into the into the uh, lake, then you're gonna, you know, that's not gonna work out well. Wow. It, it, it's, it's often, so often, the government regulations are going the wrong way. Um, what we should be doing is, is making these people, or how can I say it, creating, we, 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 we in economics express it this way, creating property rights so that when your property is violated, you've got a way of going to the court and, and, and fixing it. Right, right. Well, Deirdre, this has been amazing. Uh, you have enticed me to read all your other books. I don't know when I'm going to find time in my life to read <laughs> all these technologies, but this is an amazing topic and I am so grateful for your time. I wonder if you could share with us one more time the title of the book and where people can find you and follow you and and find the book. Well, it's on it's on Amazon, of course. Okay. Here it is. Um, it uh, right now, <clears throat> it's the top selling book in uh, some little teeny category. <laughs> to, if if you chop up these categories enough, you know the highest selling book by someone named McCluskey or something like that. But but. <laughs> And in, in, in if I got it upside down, I got it right. Yeah. Um, there it is. As I said, Amazon. It probably won't yet be in your in, in your bookstore, so don't ask there. Um, and it's not, you know, it's short. See, that's amazing. It's not that long, and it's it's kind of fun because this my 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 co-author Art Carden is a, is an economist, a professor of economics, but <laughs> he has a very uh, amusing sense of humor. Right. And he brought that into the book. So there's a kind of informality about it. You have a good sense of humor as well. Well, I got a sense of humor, but art's not quite the same. <laughs> okay. he, uh, the book discussing how bad is fail, which is very, very important that you allow bad ideas to fail. And <laughs> Art went to the trouble of listing all the Trump companies that have failed. Wow. All the Donald Trump enterprises, Donald D Trump University, Trump this, Trump that. It's very funny. It went on for about a, a long paragraph. <laughs> wow. wow. Of Trump failures. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, uh, yes, uh, good luck with everything. I, I love this conversation. Well, I've enjoyed it myself. Okay, dear, cheerio. As my dad used to say, be good. If you can't be good, be careful. 
and then I have to modify it a bit. If you can't be careful, name her after me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dietrich. Okay, love you. Bye. I'll see you.